So as we come back, I invite anyone from the audience to please share, as you so wish, any insights, thoughts, or questions you have. And I also invite Bob to come up and to respond to any questions or comments that you may have. So thank you. So let us begin. We have microphones, uh, so if you uh, feel free, just raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you, and we can continue uh, the dialogue in a larger venue. Can you give examples or speculate what a Trinitarian engagement with a pluralistic uh, movement or culture or reality would look like? Is it happening? Can it happen? I, I think it can. Uh, one of um, the things, because of the length of time, you know, I had to uh, keep things short, but uh, as I've talked with a number of you around here, one of the most exciting theological books that I've seen in the last two years uh, is by Sarah Coakley, an Anglican theologian. Um, the book is called uh, God, Sexuality, and the Self, an Essay on the Trinity. And what she suggests, among other things, the book is full of all kinds of interesting ideas, is that human desire in all its forms, including its sexuality forms, is rooted in our desire for God. And rather than starting with the first person of the Trinity, she starts with the third, the Spirit. And that the Spirit then leads us in and introduces us to the different dimensions. And that was my reason for suggesting um, the role of the Spirit, moving towards a more Spirit Christology. Uh, there where, you know, the, the, the Spirit of God overshadows Mary. The Spirit of God comes upon Jesus at baptism. The Spirit of, Je of God drives Jesus into the desert. Uh, that we'd be led in in a new and different kind of way uh, into this. And the, the plurality dimension, I think, is particularly important because we tend to think there has to be one way to do things. And it's precisely being able to embrace these other ways, uh, ways that perhaps initially may be unfamiliar, uh, becomes uh, an, important, uh, an important kind of move. We were talking about one of the existential peripheries being those of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community. Um, they, too, feel excluded. Right. And um, I like what you said about we need to address um, we, we need to expand the way we look at the people of the world because everybody is one of God's children and we all need to be called forward to that. Um, do you have any ideas as to how the church might address that? Well, I think we saw some of the possibilities uh, at the Synod last October where one of the families that got up to witness uh, you know, their, their son is gay. You know, to have that sort of thing in the Synod Hall is, was unheard of, and there were a lot of people who were upset because it was said. But I think that's the, the, the first thing we have to give is visibility and recognition. Uh, and then in that way, it, it's, it's also going to be more than uh, the rest of us saying, now, how can we be different in how we deal with... Uh, gay and lesbian people, but then to hear from them how they want to be recognized. So it has to open up that kind of thing. So, you know, when I, I mentioned um, Pope Francis's mystica of encounter, it's translated in English as mysticism of encounter, which doesn't make any sense, but mystica is the word behind it uh, in, the, in the Spanish uh, original. Uh, that you know that you have to approach with respect, you have to really listen, you have to be carried along by their narrative, and then on that basis, things will start to emerge uh, to make that happen. But the first thing is is recognition and visibility and rather than rendering them invisible. I think that those two wishes are kind of linked because, you know, most of the people my age that I speak with, you know, these are people that want to serve, you know, it's not that they're not interested in a life of service. I mean, you look at programs, you know, all the AmeriCorps programs, you look at all the various teaching programs, 
And it just reminded me of um, one story from my undergrad years. Um, I was in a social work classroom and the topic of religion came up. And so many people were talking about how they wanted a spiritual connection, but at the same time they viewed the institutional church as excluding people, and that was the biggest issue that came up, the issue of uh, the LGBT community. And the professor actually happened to be a Protestant minister as well as the professor of social work. And he kind of said um, something similar about how we need to um, listen. And the response of most of the students was, you know, we've been speaking for so long, but the church you know, doesn't seem to be listening. And there's so many ideas out there and what to do and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's time, you know, for the church to move beyond just, um, you know, how can we welcome a gay couple to mass and, you know, smile and be nice and move in a, you know, profound structural change in this area and the change in the actual teaching rather than just um, putting a smiling face on what we've been saying for the past few years. Thanks again, Bob, for uh, a wonderful, clear, um, fresh presentation, really. Um, one of the things that um, strikes me about this mystica of encounter, and you didn't use the word here, but you used it in other, um, in, in other of your works that might be helpful, and I think helpful for religious life today, is the word contemplation. Uh, you use it a lot in your reconciliation writings Sarah Coakley uses it uh, in her book on the Trinity in how to get into the whole dynamic of the Trinity. Um, Roger Schrader and I talk about it as one of the elements of mission that actually the, the, the contemplative act is actually part and parcel of what mission is. So, you know, I think some study around that uh, would be really very, very useful. Uh, as, as a way of kind of unpacking that idea of the mystica of encounter. Good, that's a good suggestion. I saw Maria taking notes. <laughs> Thanks, Bob, for a uh, wonderful way of getting us going. Uh, I want to talk about the connection, with, or ask the, the connection between religious life and prophecy, uh, which I think is, is so basic. And of course that gets us into the spirit, uh, into a Trinitarian approach. And I also recall um, Pope Francis saying he likes things messy. Uh, and it, it, as in my understanding of prophecy, that's exactly what prophecy does. It makes things messy. And so maybe one of those existential peripheries is wherever it's messy, I'm not clear. Thanks for that, Lynn. That's, that's a great, uh, great addition. And that also explains uh, or helps us recall historically why religious have been in trouble uh, so often, particularly religious women. I, I, w I had to restrain myself. I wanted to talk about uh, Mary Ward and um, Mary McKillop uh, you know, as examples that are particularly Mary McKillop recently with her canonization, you know, how she was excommunicated uh, and, and, you know, has come back. The messiness, uh, it's both revealing messiness that nobody wants to look at, and it's also making things messy when they've become a little too rigid. So thanks for that. Thank you, Bob, for your presentation. The question is, um, is there any way you suggest, you would suggest or uh, point out, you know, to make a transition, as you mentioned, Pope Francis has uh, suggested idea that the gospel is the rule for us, religious and for all people. But since many of us have been indoctrinated and the dogmas of the church, is there any way to make them, that transition from being too dogmatic to more merciful according to the idea uh, the principles of the gospel, to make a, an inclusive church? Well, I think it certainly begins for us as religious by our, our own, the quality of our own spiritual lives, you know, and, and our regular encounter uh, with the gospels, uh, because I think we have to be constantly be going back uh, to that. Uh, are we identifying 
with uh, uh, the judge, the, the, many of the judge figures that come up in the parables, uh, or are we with the, the Jesus on the road to Emmaus, you know, as an example of what I used. I think one of the ways of, of kind of overcoming a more dogmatic approach is to move away from the conceptual to the images that are presented. You know, and, and to live and to pray and be with those uh, as a way of moving forward. And I think, um, you know, we see this uh, in some of Pope Francis's own activity. Uh, he hasn't come out with a lot of decrees, but he visits places. He goes places, like most recently to the shantytown, you know, on the outskirts of Rome, or that his first, his first trip out of Rome was to Lampedusa. Uh, to the refugee center. Uh, so where we go, that's where the pilgrimage part perhaps uh, provides us something, uh, you know, of a pathway. And what was said at the very beginning I think is really important. Pilgrimage doesn't mean just wandering around aimlessly. You know, it's, it's, it's being, having kind of a keen sense for where the periphery is to which we should go. And, and to be able to see the holiness you know, the holy, the, the mystical there in those situations. So it's those kind of practices I think we need to engage in that would help us move towards this more evangelical uh, kind of way. You mentioned in the beginning of your talk that religious life always comes to respond to the need of the world or the changing of the world. My question is like, in America you see the church is always in progress, but in some other places the church probably is the most of the So how do you balance like the image of the religious life of all the world? Well, I think, uh, Reggie, that this is where the whole, this is another dimension of plurality. Not only are there so many different forms of religious life, you know, in the church, historically I mentioned just a few of the major ones. You could have talked about also, all the groups that are formed in religious life, as religious life, that set out for the reform of the church itself. You know, like the Norbertines, um, reforming the clergy. Um, so, it's going to vary a lot in places. And I think for international religious institutes, one of the key things is um, aiding good communication to realize that the, the the challenges that the world presents that the church faces in different parts of the world are going to be very different. And one size does not fit all, um, you know, in these, these kinds of situations. So I think, you know, a kind of a keen local discernment, you know, has, has to go on. But the thing that binds us together, um, you know, as we, you know, to go back to what I was saying, as we face the political in different ways, is the, 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 the mystical undercurrent, you know, there is where we can find each other even though we're doing very different things responding to very, very different questions.